A little while back, I was watching a nature documentary and I couldn't help but notice that most of the sound effects seemed to be fake, like they were added later. How do we know? Well, it's really difficult to record sound when you are far away from something. The cameras can zoom in, but the microphones can't. So take this example, filmed a good distance away and also from a helicopter. And yet in the show, we can hear the light footsteps through the grass. Now this is probably what it really sounded like. And so it's hardly surprising when we see articles confirming that lots of the sounds in nature documentaries are actually recorded in a studio. Apparently it's common practice, even as far as the classic Foley tricks like swishing bamboo. Now I personally have no problem with this. You can hardly expect them to put a mic on a giraffe or stand really close to polar bears. And sound is crucial for a rich and immersive audience experience. So they just use artistic license with the audio. But even so, this has made me look a bit closer at these nature shows. And it turns out that fake sound effects are only the tip of the iceberg. Let's look at this from the perspective of a filmmaker. Imagine that we've been tasked with filming a kangaroo fight. We're out there for a few weeks, so we're gonna spend plenty of time waiting for that golden moment. In the meantime, we might record this shot of a joey going into its mother's pouch, most likely because it wanted some milk. And then since we're waiting, might as well get some close-ups, very nice. And when the fight finally breaks out, we film that too. Now watch what happens in editing. This is how it looked in the final show. We see one fighter, we're told he's the alpha, and that this guy is challenging him. That's when the editor shows us the close-ups, and now they have a deeper meaning. It's almost like the two roos are weighing each other up in a classic western stare-down. After the glaring, we see the shot of the joey, and this time it's as if this kid knows what's about to happen and is actually hiding in the pouch. Only then does the fight begin. The point is, these editors have hours of footage for a scene like this, filmed over many days, usually weeks, and then they just choose a few moments that provide the maximum emotional impact. This shot might have been filmed a week earlier than the fight, but the editor sees it as an opportunity to humanize the animals, much like Pixar films have been doing for years. So they are manipulating the footage, but I'm not complaining. If these shows were just a string of facts about animals, most of us wouldn't watch. That's why they carve out stories in editing, why they use intense music, and why they recreate the sound effects. Because storytelling is what engages us, not facts and figures. And so what some people could see as fakery becomes something we can actually learn from. For example, one of the classic challenges in filmmaking is getting the audience to care about the characters. And while regular filmmakers can control everything that happens in front of the camera, wildlife filmmakers have to do their work without interfering with nature. So how do they get us to empathize with these characters that can't even speak? Let's take a look at this sequence. We meet this family of caribou reindeer and the filmmakers give us some time to get to know them a bit. We see the calves struggle to find their footing, which is undeniably endearing. Cute little fluffy animals are very easy to care about. That's why we see them so often in these shows. Once they've joined with the rest of the herd, the lavish orchestral theme music suddenly stops and is replaced by a low droning note that puts us on edge. It says danger is ahead. So this arctic wolf is probably the villain of this scene. Now it might be looking for food for its cute pups back at the den and this is its only chance of survival. But if so, the filmmakers don't show us that. They keep it much more anonymous, much like how villains often have their face covered, especially in Star Wars. Now, one way to raise the stakes in a story is to show how ruthless the villain is. And here we see the wolf chasing the herd, trying to weed out the weak and vulnerable. So watching this, we can't help but feel for little Bambi here, who's definitely the underdog, being targeted by a wolf who should really pick on someone their own size. And as the wolf closes in, let's cut this here. Now, have a think about these two questions. Would you rather that the wolf went hungry and Bambi survived, or do you want the wolf to get a meal? And secondly, would you be annoyed if I didn't show the ending of this scene? Because to me, that second question is a good litmus test for storytelling. If the audience isn't eager to find out how it ends, then it probably wasn't a story. Certainly not a good one. So while it is kind of disappointing to find out that nature docs have been manipulated in a few ways, we have to ask whether we really want 100% reality. Because wouldn't that just be a 24 hour live stream of nature, uncut, no music, just what's really happening. 
I couldn't watch that for very long. Of course, on the other extreme is the nature documentaries that have really misled the audience, like using computer-generated images without telling anyone, interfering with animal hunts to get better footage, or villainizing sharks as human killers. And so really, I think these BBC shows are pretty well balanced between accuracy and entertainment. There's enough enhancements in storytelling that we can enjoy the show, while still appreciating the complexity of nature. Oh, and by the way, in the wolf chase scene, Bambi managed to escape. My name's Simon Cade, this has been DSLR Guide, and I'll see you next week.